You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the Rand Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from Rand's latest research and commentary. It's April 8th. Rand experts have been weighing in on key issues related to the war in Ukraine this week. To open the show today, we'll cover just a sample of what they had to say. Insurgency has been used by national liberation movements to free themselves from colonial rule, by Marxist revolutionaries and Islamist militants, and by the U.S. and the Soviet Union in proxy conflicts around the world. In fact, insurgency has become the world's most common form of warfare. But these campaigns of resistance rarely offer a path to early victory in a conflict. Insurgent campaigns often become endurance contests that take decades to resolve, and they're commonly viewed as an alternative to conventional combat, used by weaker parties that cannot prevail in a stand-up fight. But, according to Rand's James Dobbins, insurgency could be an effective tool in Ukraine's fight against Russian occupiers. That is, if it's used as a complement to conventional battle. When employed in this manner, insurgency can yield much quicker results by threatening an enemy's lines of communication and drawing off its forces from the main battle. Dobbins says, quote, Insurgency alone offers, at best, the prospect of distant success at tremendous cost. When combined with a stalemated but still active conventional battle, however, it may provide the defender the decisive edge. So far, Ukraine appears to have Russia beat in the information war. Ukrainians have executed a sophisticated information campaign to shape global opinions, rouse domestic morale, and even persuade Russian soldiers to lay down their arms. But RAND experts warn that Ukraine's success is not a reason for U.S. leaders to deprioritize investments in informational capabilities. Russia has significant information warfare capabilities and is ready to use them. Moscow's information manipulation was on display this week, in fact, when the Kremlin called footage uncovering horrors in the Ukrainian city of Bucha a, quote, forgery aimed at denigrating the Russian army. In an interview with CTV News in Canada, Rand's Christopher Paul said that this message from Russian officials was likely designed to get people in Western countries to be skeptical about the evidence of atrocities committed by the Russian military. It's classic Russian strategy, Paul says, to use disinformation to distract, distort, dismay, and obfuscate. Looking ahead, what might it take to bring the war to an end? The answer may come down to what Rand's Raphael Cohen calls three internal clocks. Ukraine's clock, Russia's clock, and a third clock shared by the U.S. and NATO. Ukraine's clock, which revolves around how long the country is willing to continue fighting, could run on for years, Cohen says. Ukrainians show no signs of backing down, and history has shown that populations will continue to fight against the odds if they believe they can win, or at the very least, if they feel they have no choice but to persevere. Then there's Russia's clock, which may not have quite as much time left. Russia's clock revolves around Vladimir Putin and how secure he is in his power. For example, if the war risks a significant enough backlash from the Russian people that it threatens his hold on power, then there may be reason for Putin to end his aggression. Another factor affecting Russia's clock? Military wherewithal. Russia has already lost between 7,000 and 15,000 of its original 150,000 soldiers and over 10% of its initial combat power. If it cannot make good on its losses, then it risks exhausting itself. Finally, the U.S. and NATO. The West's clock will keep ticking as it considers whether and when to intervene in the conflict. Cohen says that these three clocks force the U.S. into a delicate balancing act. Washington must keep enough pressure on Moscow so that Russia's clock continues to count down quicker than Ukraine's, but not so much pressure that the Kremlin feels forced to gamble and escalate its attacks dramatically. The stakes, of course, could not be higher. 
How it all plays out may determine the fate of Ukraine and Europe. You can read more about these topics and find all of Rand's insights on the war in Ukraine at www.rand.org slash Russia Ukraine. A RAND report released this week looks at one potential solution to help address the housing crisis in Los Angeles. The study finds that repurposing commercial properties such as hotels and vacant office buildings could provide LA with about 9 to 14 percent of the housing it needs over the next eight years. This is based on our researchers' analysis of 2,300 potentially underutilized commercial properties. If the city fully utilized these properties for residential purposes, then it could theoretically produce 72,000 to 113,000 units of housing in L.A. County, depending on the mix of unit sizes. The researchers identified hotel or motel properties as the best option for conversion to housing. While this study reveals promising results, it's important to note that to fully see the benefits of repurposing commercial buildings, the city may need to offer significant incentives to developers of both market rate and affordable housing projects. As lead author Jason Ward sums it up, quote, repurposing commercial buildings to help address Los Angeles County's housing shortage is a compelling idea, but the economics and logistics of such projects are complex. Another new RAND report seeks to understand how U.S. efforts to liberate Raqqa, Syria from ISIS in 2017 led to civilian harm. The findings suggest that even though civilian casualties in Raqqa were not as high as might have been expected given the level of structural damage, an estimated 60 to 80 percent of the city was left uninhabitable. America's strategic and operational choices in the battle likely increased civilian harm. These choices included the decision to encircle Raqqa and the insufficient shaping of the battlefield with pre-planned, carefully targeted airstrikes prior to ground force engagements. The battle for Raqqa is a cautionary tale about civilian harm in urban combat, says lead author Michael McNerney. In a broader analysis released earlier this year, McNerney and co-authors found that the Pentagon is not equipped to sufficiently assess, reduce, and respond to civilian harm incidents, and that institutional reform is needed. The researchers made a number of recommendations to improve policies and procedures around preventing civilian harm, which the DOD has been working to implement. In 2019, U.S. spending on hospital care totaled $1.2 trillion, accounting for 32% of all health care expenditures and more than 5% of the nation's gross domestic product. One factor underlying the high cost of hospital care is the prices paid by commercial health plans. These prices have been increasing substantially over time, and so has the gap between what commercial health plans pay hospitals and the prices paid by public programs like Medicare. To better understand this issue, RAND researchers examined national hospital data and compared commercial health plan hospital pricing to that of Medicare. The results show that the average differences between these prices were relatively stable between 2012 and 2019. However, the differences were not consistent across the country. In fact, there was large variation in these price ratios from region to region. Some areas saw large increases, others saw significant declines. California had the largest number of hospital markets with large increases, with 11 of the top 19 regions. Wisconsin had three of the regions with the largest increases. But the 19 regions with the largest decreases were more geographically diverse, although four were in Indiana. So what does this wide variability mean? Well, it suggests that there may be opportunities to constrain rising hospital prices and, in turn, make healthcare more affordable for Americans. For decades, higher education and a bachelor's degree have been viewed as crucial stepping stones to the middle class. But more than half of Americans still have not, and likely will not, receive four-year degrees. In 2021, college enrollment actually declined. And while the pandemic likely played a role in this, deeper trends persist. 
Tuition costs have increased by more than 500% since the 1980s, leaving many students with student loan debt that takes decades to pay off. At the same time, businesses are hiring and wages are rising, so the cost of taking time off work to earn a degree is higher too. It's no wonder, says Rand researcher Lindsay Daugherty, that many Americans are questioning the value of a college degree. So, if four years of college is no longer the ideal pathway to the middle class, then what is? Shorter-term technical certificates and applied associate's degrees may be better options for many Americans, Dr. T says, especially those who are working full-time, raising kids, or simply have limited time and financial resources. In fact, a recent Rand paper found that earning shorter-term non-degree credentials often led to increases in earnings of $2,000 to $6,500 per year, while costing a fraction of what college tuition does on average. Last year marked the 25th anniversary of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, which proclaimed, quote, marriage is the foundation of a successful society and fulfilled then-President Bill Clinton's campaign promise to, quote, end welfare as we know it. When this legislation passed in 1996, it enshrined into law the opinion that mothers should be married, says Rand economist Catherine Edwards. And it's representative of some policymakers' long-held view that single mothers are a social problem, often portrayed as so-called welfare queens and teen moms who don't want to work. But the data has never backed up this portrayal, Edwards points out. And that may be why social policy changes aimed at encouraging single mothers to get married have not been effective at helping them out of poverty. The persistence of poverty among single mothers over the last 25 years is a reminder that economic problems need economic solutions, says Edwards. Policies such as paid family leave and broadly subsidized childcare would do far more to help single moms get back into the workforce and lift their families out of poverty than policies that promote marriage. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered in this episode, check the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We're off next week, but we'll be back in your feeds on April 22nd. See you then.